Marilyn Vanderbilt is one of the outstanding women of America. Her speeches are consistently followed by standing ovation. She changes people's lives. While a student at the University of Colorado, she was elected Miss America. After that busy year, she returned to college and graduated with Phi Beta Kappa honors. She has been the hostess of 23 network television specials. Although television was exciting, she felt a need to express her own ideas and embarked on a career in public speaking. She has since been selected as the Outstanding Woman Speaker of America. She is the president of her own company, which distributes VHS and DVDs throughout North America. Currently, Marilyn addresses an average of 10,000 people a week at local, state, and national meetings and conventions. And now, her message. Hello, I'm Marilyn Vanderbilt. During the past 16 years, I've devoted the major portion of my time to addressing adult and youth conventions on motivational topics. The more I become involved with people, the more I begin to realize the need there is to talk about, think about, discuss ideas that relate to our personal lives. For example, if I asked you if you consider yourself to be a success or a failure, how would you answer? Well, let me tell you just a little bit about three other people and ask you to guess which you think they probably were in their chosen fields, a success or a failure. Number one, he ran for political office seven times and was defeated each time. Number two, she wanted to be a performer. She went to drama school in New York. After several months, the school wrote her mother that she had no acting ability at all. They said, take her home. Number three, he wanted to publish a children's book. It was rejected by publishers 54 times. Were the three of them failures in their chosen fields? Let me share with you some interesting facts. On page 286 in one of our major encyclopedias, there is an outline of Abraham Lincoln's life. Let me give you an example of what it says. Early life, search for a career, success in politics, congressman, return to law, re-entry into politics, the debates with Douglas, election as President of the United States in 1860. Now let me give you some facts about Abraham Lincoln that were not listed in the outline of his life. 1832, lost job, defeated for legislature. 1833, failed in business. 1834, elected to legislature. 1835, sweetheart died. 1836, nervous breakdown. During the next 24 years, he was elected only once to Congress, and yet he was defeated for Speaker, defeated for nomination of Congress, defeated for Senate, defeated for nomination of Vice President, again defeated for Senate. Seven political defeats. Really, nine failures out of 11 tries. Was Abraham Lincoln a success or a failure? A winner or a loser? He was both. She wanted to be a performer. She went to drama school in New York. After several months, the school wrote her mother that she had no acting ability at all. They said, take her home. In 1953, 29 million people watched Eisenhower's inauguration as President of the United States on television. 33 million people watched the coronation of Queen Elizabeth on television. And 40 million people watched one episode of I Love Lucy. When the very first I Love Lucy show went on the air in 1951, it was rated one of the country's top ten. At the end of 20 shows, it was the number one show and remained the number one show for five years. It's still on TV in reruns. Lucille Ball lived in Jamestown, New York. She knew as a child she wanted to be a performer, and so at age 16, with her mother's permission, she went to New York City to a drama school. They said she had no acting ability at all and asked her mother to take her home. But how could she go home? She had told everyone in Jamestown she was going to be an actress. So she auditioned as a Ziegfeld showgirl and was hired without pay for four weeks of rehearsal. She was fired before the opening night. She rehearsed with three other big musicals and each time was similarly fired. She hadn't earned one penny. After two years with no success, she found a job as a model. Then she caught pneumonia and had severe pains in both legs. The doctor said there was a possibility she would never walk again. She went to the hospital as a charity case and then home to bed in Jamestown. 
She remained in bed for many months, then on crutches, then on a cane. She had to wear 20-pound weights in her shoes. It was two years before she was well again. She first went to New York at age 16. She returned to New York at age 22. There isn't time to go into the rest of her struggles to become an entertainer. The only reason I use the example at all is because I believe some people believe that one day a Hollywood agent saw Lucille Ball and said, you're going to be the funniest, the best-loved comedian in America, and it just did not happen that way. How old do you think Lucille Ball was when the very first I Love Lucy show went on the air? She was 40 years old. How old do you think she was when her first child, Lucy Arnaz, was born? She was 40 years old. Is Lucille Ball a success or a failure? If you read her fascinating life story, you will find she has been both a success and a failure. He wanted to write and illustrate children's books, but he just drew so differently than the other students. At the end of his first high school art class, his teacher said, you'll never learn to draw Theodore. Why don't you just skip this class for the rest of the term? But in his late 20s, he decided to write and illustrate that children's book, but it was turned down 54 times by different publishers. A friend of his at Vanguard Press decided to take a chance, and at age 33, Ted Geisel, better known as Dr. Seuss, had his first book, and to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street, published. It has sold over 300,000 copies. He's written 38 other books. This has always been my favorite. They're never very thick, but it takes him an average of a year to write one, and he estimates that he writes and draws more than 1,000 pages for every 64 pages that are finely used in each book. Is it possible that sometimes the difference between success and failure is trying just a little harder, trying one more publisher, studying 20 minutes longer, interviewing for a job just one more time? Could it be that the difference between success and failure could be trying just one more time? She wanted to be a leader when she ran for the president of her college class, she lost. She ran for the Texas legislature and lost. Two years later, she ran again and lost. Two years later, Barbara Jordan ran for the Texas Senate and won, becoming the first black senator in 100 years. When she later ran for the United States House of Representatives, she was elected by an overwhelming majority. She electrified America with her keynote speech to the Democratic National Convention. But there is something different about tonight. There is something special about tonight. What is different? What is special? I, Barbara Jordan, am a keynote speaker. A lot of years passed since 1832, and during that time it would have been most unusual for any national political party to ask a Barbara Jordan to deliver a keynote address. But tonight, here I am, and I feel... I feel that notwithstanding the past, that my presence here is one additional bit of evidence that the American dream need not forever be deferred. She said, I didn't get where I am by being black or a woman. I got here by working hard. My parents taught me that you get what is due you if you just keep after it. If it doesn't come, then maybe the time isn't right. Maybe some other time, it will be right. Have you ever run for an office, lost, and then decided you weren't meant to be a leader, 
John F. Kennedy was one of 35 to run for the president of his freshman class in college. He was eliminated on the first ballot. President Gerald Ford ran for the president of his high school class and lost. President Jimmy Carter ran for the governor of Georgia and was defeated. Have you ever failed a grade or a course or were not able to get into the college of your choice or for any number of reasons didn't graduate? And so deep in the back of your mind, you think of yourself as not as intelligent as those who did. Edward Gibson wanted to excel in science or engineering when he grew up. He flunked first and fourth grades. He went on to become one of three astronauts in the Skylab 3 mission. 1,492 men applied for this assignment. Six were chosen, three went on the mission, and Edward Gibson, who had flunked first and fourth grades, was one of them. Bobby Kennedy flunked third grade. Jerry Brown wanted to be a lawyer, but flunked the bar exam, took it again, passed, and went on to become the governor of California. Winston Churchill, England's most famous prime minister and military leader, failed three times in his exams to enter the military academy. Albert Einstein, perhaps the greatest scientist of all time, failed the entrance exam when he tried to enroll in an institute of technology. Were these people successes or failures? Winners or losers? They were both. But when they were failures or losers, they didn't quit. Has the same been true in your life? In trying to solve a problem, she tried 487 experiments, all of which failed. This was Madame Curie, the woman scientist who isolated radium. Let me tell you what she said when her 487th experiment failed. She and her husband Pierre had been trying to isolate radium. He threw up his hands. He said it will never be done, maybe in a hundred years, but never in our day. She replied, if it takes a hundred years, it will be a pity, but I will not cease working for it as long as I live. Now, I don't know whether she isolated radium on the 500th try or on the 600th try, but I do know that she was a failure for at least 487 times before she was successful. He wanted to be an outstanding businessman. He wanted to own his own candy store. At 19, he tried to operate his own candy shop. It failed. He went to New York and tried to manufacture candy. That failed, too. At age 46, he built the largest candy factory in the world. His name? Milton S. Hershey. There probably isn't anyone who hasn't eaten a Hershey candy bar. As a child... Eugene Orowitz was short, skinny, and unpopular. He was from a different religious background than other children, and they called him names. But what humiliated him is that he wet his bed. As a teenager, he was so embarrassed about his bedwetting that it even affected his grades. He graduated 299th out of a class of 301, third from last. Eugene Orowitz later changed his name to Michael Landon. He couldn't help the bedwetting, but his mother thought he did it to punish her. So she would hang his sheet out the window to punish and humiliate him. She became even angrier, knowing he didn't, when he spent the night at a friend's house. She didn't know he would sit up all night, sometimes slapping himself so he wouldn't fall asleep. He was 14 years old before it stopped. When Michael Landon was 22, his father, who had watched his shame and humiliation, said, Son... I was a teenage bedwetter, too. He said, why didn't he tell me? Why didn't he tell me when I was 14? So I wouldn't have felt so alone. Years later, when he decided to make a film about a teenage bedwetter who went on to become an Olympic champion, he needed a stadium filled with 70 to 80,000 people to cheer this boy on to his victory. Phone call after phone call to football team owners left him with the same answer. There is no possible way I can give you a halftime during a televised professional football game to let you stage your race. But when he called Carol Rosenblum, the owner of the Los Angeles Rams, he was amazed when he said, sure, Michael. Just tell me what you need, and I'll have it for you. They talked for more than an hour, and then just as they were saying goodbye, Mr. Rosenblum said, 
Oh, by the way, Michael, I was a teenage bedwetter, too. His goal, his dream, was to win the gold medal in the decathlon in the Olympics. He placed only 10th at the Olympic Games in Munich after four years of intensive training. Bruce Jenner won the gold medal in the Montreal Olympics in the decathlon. And her goal was to win a gold medal in the 1972 Olympic Games in the women's downhill skiing event. She came in second. She trained with grueling intensity and dedication for the 1976 Olympics, but dropped out to care for her father, who was very ill. He died several weeks after the Olympics. Her quest for the goal of her life had been interrupted by a more important priority, to sit at her father's bedside for the weeks and months before his death. Anna Marie Moser Prohl once again began training for the 1980 Olympics. She had been training for the Olympics for 12 years, skiing with all of her heart, energy, skill, and enthusiasm, and with a picture of her father stitched into the lining of her skin-tight suit, Anna Marie won the Olympic gold medal and claimed the dream of her life. She wanted to write a newspaper column as a financial advisor, but no newspaper or magazine would use a woman for this influential position. So for the first seven years, her daily column in the New York Post appeared under the name of S.F. Porter. Today, Sylvia Porter has written seven books, and her Sylvia Porter columns are published in 450 newspapers throughout the world. His father always told him he was a no-good bum. He was born in a ghetto in Dallas, slept in one bed with his two brothers, and lived in a very tough neighborhood. He was skinny, scared, and was beaten up regularly by other children. He was only seven when he had a nervous breakdown. It was two years before he could leave his bed and be coaxed back to school. Today, Aaron Spelling is one of television's top producers, having produced such shows as Charlie's Angels, Love Boat, Vegas, Fantasy Island, Family, and Heart to Heart. In fact, he has produced more primetime shows than MGM, 20th Century Fox, Columbia Pictures, and Warner Brothers combined. He wanted to be a writer. Never in eight years of writing did he have one single article accepted for publication. He had literally hundreds of rejection slips. At age 37... All he had was 18 cents in his pocket and two cans of sardines to eat. Alex Haley was a cook in the Coast Guard for 20 years. He said it was so boring and lonely being on a ship that he began writing lots of letters. Soon crew members began asking him to write letters for them, particularly love letters. The first time he considered writing for a living, he took a book he was reading and began copying it word for word. He began to realize that each word must have a reason. Alex Haley spent 12 years, 12 years, researching and writing Roots. He was 55 when it was published. It became one of the best-selling books of all time. Is Alex Haley a winner or a loser? A success or a failure? He has been both, but when he was losing and when he was failing, he never quit. She wanted to be a comedian, but Carol Burnett's childhood was anything but funny. Both her father and her mother were alcoholics. She lived with her grandmother in a run-down, one-room apartment where the bed pulled down out of the wall and stayed there. Their glasses were old peanut butter and jelly jars. Her closet was the bathroom shower rack. She said, I was too embarrassed to ever let a boy into our apartment. I would always wait in the lobby and say, my grandmother isn't feeling well. She once said, I don't think you can be truly funny unless you have had suffering. He wanted to be an outstanding businessman. At age 52, he had been selling milkshake mixers for years, which had put him $100,000 in debt. His other jobs included selling paper cups for 17 years, playing the piano in a nightclub, and selling real estate in Florida. He had diabetes, arthritis, had lost his gallbladder, and most of his thyroid gland. One day this man went in to see a drive-in restaurant that was using so many of his mixers they could make 48 milkshakes at one time. He was so impressed. He persuaded them to let him franchise the same drive-in in other cities. Ray Kroc, 
keeping the name of that first restaurant, opened his first McDonald's in Des Plaines, Illinois, at age 52. There are now more than 6,000 McDonald's in the United States and 21 other countries. His failures, his illnesses, the fact that he was $100,000 in debt and 52 years old never kept him from seeking and accomplishing the goal of his life, that of being an outstanding businessman. In the spring of 1980, she stood in an auditorium so packed with college students, many were lining the walls. You could almost feel the air of electric excitement as she looked at her audience from left to right and said, my mother is a deaf mute. I do not know who my father was or is. The first job I ever had was as a cotton picker, and I stand before you this day, the treasurer of the United States of America. My name is A.Z. Taylor Morton. Nobody has to remain the way they are if that's not the way they want to be, because it isn't luck, and it isn't circumstances, and it isn't being born that way that makes your dream come true. The next time you're tempted to think, luck, can't do it, take out a dollar bill and look at my signature and say, if she can do it, so can I. In sports, he struck out 1,330 times in baseball. This baseball player held the world's record for striking out. No one had ever struck out more times than he did. 1,330 times he walked up to the plate, swung with all his might, hit the air, and then took that humiliating long walk back to the bench. But this baseball player also held another world record. Until Henry Aaron, no one had ever hit more home runs than Babe Ruth. 714 home runs, and yet he also held the record for striking out. But who remembers the fact that he failed almost twice as many times as he succeeded? He wanted a sketch in cartoon. He applied for a job with a Kansas City newspaper. After looking at his work, the editor said, to be frank with you, it's easy to see from these sketches that you have no talent. This boy was crushed because that's all he wanted to do, sketch and cartoon. He went from studio to studio, always being turned down. Finally, he got a job drawing publicity material for a church. He couldn't afford an office, so he rented an old, dilapidated garage. It was infested with mice. As he would sketch, the mice would run back and forth as he tried to concentrate. Thirty years later, Walt Disney was famous, and so was one of the mice. I'd like to conclude this theme with one final thought. I believe it's possible to be a success in failure. How would it be possible to succeed if you lost? Peter Strudwick is a marathon runner. A marathon is 26.2 miles. He has never won a race. But he is a winner in every sense of the word. He was born with no right hand and his left hand has only a thumb and one finger. And he was born with no feet. His legs end in stumps. He started running seriously at the age of 39. He said, I've lost every race I've entered, but I'll never be a loser. I'll be out there running for as many years as I can. And if in my last race the mountain is too steep to run, I'll jog it. And if I can't jog, I'll walk. And if I can't walk, I'll crawl on all fours. And when I can no longer crawl, I'll shout words of fire and glory to those around me. Yes, Peter is a winner. Failure is never trying. Failure is quitting. Jerry Trailer ran in the Denver Marathon. Jerry has cerebral palsy, but he ran 26.2 miles on crutches. Many athletic, healthy, strong men and women never finished that race, but Jerry did. When he fell, he just picked himself back up and kept on running. Did he win? No. The winner ran the marathon in two hours and 25 minutes. It took Jerry seven hours, 14 minutes, and 38 seconds to complete the 26.2 miles. He came in 864th last.
Is Jerry a winner? You bet. Winning is total effort and involvement. Failure is never trying. Failure is quitting when you aren't doing well. How many of you will never finish a race or school or a project because you aren't doing well? How many of you will never even participate in athletics, civic events, committees because you would never want to embarrass yourself or fail? What are you counting in your life? Your successes or your failures? Are you not going to try for something because you did once and you didn't make it? Are you not going to try because you are afraid to fail? You will decide what your life is going to be. You can remain shy, mediocre, and apathetic. You can quit and just let the world go by. Or you can find the way to accomplish something that is important to you. I'm not suggesting that you should go out and try to win an election or a race or a title. I'm not suggesting that success is being famous or a movie star or a governor. I just hope that sometime, somewhere, there was something that you wanted to accomplish, and if you didn't, you'll just think about these examples. Everyone is both a success and a failure in a lifetime. If you have ever thought about yourself as a failure in anything, I only hope you will reconsider what is success, what is failure, and remember that in the final analysis, you alone will decide which you will be. Hello, I'm Marilyn Vanderber. Several years ago, I was asked to address a national convention on the general topic of success. And in my remarks, I talked about people whose successes were well known. Walt Disney, Lucille Ball, Alex Haley. But I also mentioned some of the failures and disappointments they had experienced, which most people were unaware of. The purpose was to illustrate that success and failure are a part of everyone's life. A teenage boy came up to me after the meeting and said, I now realize that failure is a part of everyone's life, but I tried out for the basketball team twice and I didn't make it either time. How many times should I try? When do I know when to quit? I thought those were important, intelligent questions. Have you had a failure or a major disappointment? Did you try again? Should you try again? There is no one answer. Every person is different. Every situation is different. But there are interesting examples to think about to help you decide in your own mind the answer to the questions, how hard should you try? How long should you try? When do you know when to quit? Let me share with you some startling statistics in the field of selling. It has been said that half of the salespeople in America will take his or her talent or product and make one call, and if they don't make the sale, they will try somewhere else. 18% go back to the same person with the same product a second time, 7% go a third time, 5% go four times, and 20% go back five or more times to the same person for the same idea or the same product, and these people make 80% of all sales. Have you ever tried to sell someone something, been rejected, and then gone back to the same person with the same idea or product? Have you ever applied for a job, been rejected, and then gone back to the same person for the same job? Have you ever gone back even once? W. Clement Stone, the president of Combined Life Insurance Company, tells about Al Allen, one of his Wisconsin salesmen. Al tried to sell insurance one day just by knocking on every single home and apartment door in one certain block. He worked all day and didn't make one sale. That night, he thought about his presentation 
and decided that the next day he was going to take that same block, knock on the same doors, talk to the same people, and sell more insurance policies in that one day than any of the other salespeople would sell all week. The next day, he sold 66 new insurance policies. Edwin East, a metal cabinet salesman learning about what Al had done, went to his record file and analyzed 10 accounts that showed no possibility of buying. He prepared a program to present to each one of them and sold 8 out of 10. How hard and how long do you try? Roger Horchow has a mail order house, and 11 times a year, customers receive a beautiful 32-page catalog filled with gift selections. Why doesn't he send the catalog just twice a year? Why 11 times a year? Because they know you have to ask more than once, more than twice. John McPhee wanted to be a staff writer for the New Yorker magazine. He was interviewed three times, and each time turned down. For 15 years, while doing other jobs, he kept submitting articles. He finally got the job. But he says, you have to be willing to hang in there day after day and stay at it. It was what I wanted, and I kept trying for 15 years until I got it. Marlon Brando, superstar. When he wanted to play the role of a godfather, the producer Al Ruddy said the idea of using Brando got an absolutely violent response at the studio. Did he say, well, okay, I tried? No. He hired the cameras and the lighting technicians, makeup man, director, and entire studio. It was very expensive to do his own test and very effective. He became the godfather. When I decided to use Marlon Brando as an example, I knew I wanted that picture. Although I tracked the photographer to his Los Angeles studio after only five phone calls, it took 14 more long-distance calls, asking, reminding, asking, reminding, over a two-and-a-half-month period before the picture finally arrived on my desk. Even securing of the visuals for these films brought home the message, try, try again, and again, and again. Virginia Wade's dream was one day to win at Wimbledon. She had played in the world-famous tournament every year for 15 years and each time had lost. The 16th year, she won. How long do you try? Margaret Jordan decided to run for city council in a Kansas City suburb, Leewood, population 12,000. She went door to door and called on every single household personally, one by one. She knocked on 943 doors. She won by 13 votes. How hard do you try? So many people believe movies are made quickly. Do you remember the fight scene in the movie Rocky? They spent 35 and a half hours of rehearsal for every one minute you saw on film. 35 and a half hours for every one minute. So many people believe speeches are given ad lib. One of the most vivid memories I have of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is the speech he gave at the Washington Memorial. It was the largest gathering of people that had ever taken place in America. 200,000 people heard a speech America will long remember. I have a dream. My poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. But it was not the first time he had said those words. Two months before in Detroit, he had said the same words, the same sentences, the same ideas. He didn't just write that speech the night before or the week before. Those ideas, those exact words had been formulating in his mind for months. Bob Richards is a former Olympic champion and now one of America's most exciting and sought after speakers. One day after addressing a large high school assembly, I heard a student say to him, I'd give anything in the world if I could speak in public the way you do. And Bob turned to the boy and he said, if you would really like to be a fine public speaker, then go out as I did 
and give 7,000 speeches? Or how many times have you been asked to write a report for your job or a theme in school? How long and how hard have you tried to find the right ideas, the right words? Ernest Hemingway is one of America's best-known authors. He won the Pulitzer Prize, the Nobel Prize. He wrote For Whom the Bell Tolls, The Old Man in the Sea. Wouldn't you think that by the time he got to the last chapter of Farewell to Arms, the ideas would be coming so quickly he couldn't even get them down on paper fast enough how many times do you think he rewrote the last chapter to Farewell to Arms? Thirty-nine times. Sometimes he would spend an entire morning on one paragraph. When a young writer met the famous author Somerset Mom, she said, sometimes I spend an entire day bogged down on one sentence. And he replied, my dear young woman, that's the only thing you've said to me that makes me think you may one day be a novelist. Judy Bloom wanted to write books for children. The first time she sent a book to the publisher, it came back with a rejection slip. She said, I went into a closet and cried. She would get as many as six rejection slips a week. She would go to bed thinking, I'll never get anything published, but she'd wake up saying, I will too. After two and a half years and 20 books rejected, her book, The One in the Middle, is the Green Kangaroo, was accepted. She was so excited, so hysterically happy, that one of her children's friends ran home and said, Mrs. Bloom has gone crazy. Her children's books have sold more than six million copies. Are contests easily won? Are the winners lucky? Were they born to be winners? All of us have a lucky break sometime in our lives, but most people who accomplish what they want in life by trying again and again and again. This is even true in the world of pageants. My favorite example involves a girl named Lori. She wanted more than anything else to be Miss Ohio. During her freshman year at Ohio University, she entered the Miss Southern Ohio pageant and won. Went to the Miss Ohio pageant, didn't even place in the final ten. Her sophomore year, she entered the Miss Central Ohio pageant. 143 girls entered. During her talent number, she forgot the words to her song, but she won. Went back to the Miss Ohio pageant, placed in the final ten, but not in the final five. She said in a letter to me, after losing twice, I felt I wasn't attractive enough and that I just didn't have what it took. But my junior year, when I heard they were having a local pageant on my campus, I just couldn't resist. And so her junior year, she once again entered a local pageant and returned to the Miss Ohio pageant. She placed in the final ten, placed in the final five. She was only the second runner-up. For the third year in a row in front of her family, and friends, and everyone she knew, she had lost again. Two days later, the state pageant official called her on the phone and said, Lori, the judges did not understand the balloting. We have recounted the ballots, and you won. But it's already been publicly announced. There's nothing we can do about it. How unfair. What would you have done if you'd been Lori? Would you have run to the newspaper and said, I'm Miss Ohio, the title and the scholarship money are mine, and embarrassed the girl who had just been crowned? Lori decided to try one more time. And so, during her senior year in college, while preparing for her final exams, she again prepared to enter the Miss Central Ohio pageant, which she won, went back to the Miss Ohio pageant, which she won, and on to Atlantic City, where she was crowned Miss America of 1972, Lori Schaefer. Miss America, again, Laurel Lee Schaefer, Miss Ohio, now being fitted with all the accoutrements of office. Warm and fair she is. The biggest 
event during my year as Miss America was my homecoming in Denver. They had prepared for two months. There were parades, bands, banquets, breakfasts, but one of the most important events was a huge press conference. It was held in the ballroom of one of our largest hotels. I was scared to death, and I hoped that it would get off to a good start. There was a pleasant-looking young man with his hand raised for the first question. He said, Miss Vandiver, as I recall, last year you were nominated for Queen of Regis College here in Denver. Is that right? And I said, yes. He said, you couldn't even win Queen of Regis. How can you be Miss America? It certainly wasn't the question I had hoped for, but he was right. I hadn't even won the queen of a small college in Denver, and yet I was Miss America. I just smiled and said I was glad the same judges weren't in Atlantic City. Perhaps you're saying, well, those are unusual examples. Maybe you weren't the prettiest girl in your school, and maybe Lori tried four times, but it usually doesn't happen that way. I believe it happens that way in every field, in pageants, in sports, art, music, law, science, in every field. But let's look at pageants. Is Lori an unusual example? How many girls since 1955 have entered and lost before winning in Atlantic City? These are just the ones I happen to know about. Miss America of 1955, 57. 59, 64, 65, 68. Miss America of 1971, this is Phyllis George, television personality and the wife of the governor of Kentucky. She entered a local pageant in Texas and didn't even place in the final five. Two years later, she entered again and won, but placed only third in the Miss Texas pageant. The next year, she entered again and won the local pageant the Miss Dallas pageant, and the Miss America pageant. Others who have entered and lost before winning in Atlantic City, Miss America of 1972, 74, 75, and 1978. Most young women do not want to be Miss Ohio or Miss Texas or Miss America. But think back on something that was important to you. Did you try only once, only twice, Mickey Mantle, one of the great baseball players, one of the outstanding hitters of all time, once said that he had struck out more than 1,700 times. He said he had also walked more than 1,700 times. He said a player usually comes to bat 500 times a year. That could mean, if you lumped all my walks and strikeouts together, it would mean that I didn't hit a ball for seven years. And yet he was a champion. He continued to go to bat no matter how many times he struck out. How do you react when you strike out? How many more times do you try? A good batting average in baseball is 300. That means a player hits three balls out of ten times at bat. That means he does not hit seven. And that's a good batting average. Isn't the same true in life? I shared these ideas in a student assembly recently. And the next day, a boy wrote to me. He said, my father and I had not spoken to each other in a long time. We had argued so many times, we had just stopped speaking. After you talked about how hard should you try, I thought about it. And then I went home and I said to my dad, I'll try again, if you'll try again. And so we sat down and talked, really talked. And he listened, and I listened. After our talk last night, we had a much better understanding of one another. But remember, practice doesn't always make perfect Practice doesn't make perfect unless you're practicing the right things. If your tennis serve is completely wrong and you continue to practice it day after day, you will continue to have a very bad tennis serve. Sometimes, many times, you will need to try another way. I love the story of Newt Hampson. He failed at everything, literally everything he tried was a failure. What could he do? He wrote a book on his failures entitled Hunger. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature. I recently addressed a large meeting in Kalamazoo, Michigan. There were 7,000 people. And I met a most delightful man who was also one of the speakers, Art Fettig. He gave me a copy of his book, Selling Lucky. 
And then he told me the story about how it got published. After writing it, he immediately sent it to the Fell Corporation, one of the top publishing companies in the field on motivation. And Mr. Fell rejected it. So Art spent $5,000 of his own money and published the book and sent him a copy. Mr. Fell said, why didn't you show me this book before you printed it? We want it. We'll buy all the copies you have, distribute them, and immediately print another 15,000. When Art showed him the rejection letter, he just smiled. Art had gone back to the same person, but he had tried another way. When Carol Burnett went to New York to become a comedian actress, she couldn't get a job because she had no experience. But how could she get experience if she couldn't get a job? Month after month, she kept knocking on doors and auditioning until her grandmother wrote that if she hadn't found a job on stage by Christmas, she would have to come home. She kept auditioning and interviewing. And then she had a different idea. Why not join with the others in the rehearsal club, put on their own show, and send out invitations to all the agents and critics? So they worked together, creating scenery, writing music and lyrics, doing the choreography, and soon opened for a three-night rehearsal club review. She got her first job the next day. How fortunate for all of us that she had tried another way. When Jessica Savage was 15, she was asked to be on a high school radio show in her hometown. She said, the minute I walked into the studio, I knew what I wanted to do with my life. By the following year, she was doing the radio show herself. But in college, no matter how hard she tried, she couldn't get a job on the college radio station. So she found another way. As a disc jockey, at a station an hour and a half from campus, every day after class, in rain, snow, even on those beautiful spring days, she would drive one and a half hours to the radio station, do the show, and then drive one and a half hours home. After graduation, she went to New York looking for a job. But she was told that women's voices were not authoritative enough to do television news. But within a few years, she became a network correspondent and is today one of the most successful women in network news. When Bob Pettit was 13, he tried out for the football team and didn't make it. In baseball, he was always the last one picked. So he decided to concentrate on basketball. His first year, he didn't make one point the entire season. His second year, 17 boys tried out for the team. Bob was one of the five not chosen. He certainly had tried, and at each turn, he had been rejected. He decided to try another way. He asked his minister if they could form a church team. They did, and Bob began practicing at home. He took a wire coat hanger and made a hoop which hung over the garage door. He began a routine of practice that he followed for the next seven years. He would shoot baskets for two hours before dinner and then again until bedtime. During the summer at camp, he did nothing but play basketball for six weeks, ten hours a day, seven days a week. As a junior, he made the varsity team. This boy who couldn't even make the team as a freshman or as a sophomore tried another way, played on a church team, and went on to become one of the great professional basketball players of all time. When he retired from basketball, he had scored more points than any other player in the history of basketball. Harrison Dillard is one of the greatest athletes America has produced. There was little question he would qualify for the Olympic team in the 110-meter hurdles. He hadn't been beaten in 83 consecutive races in two and a half years of competition. At the Olympic trials, six entered the event. Three would be chosen to represent America. The gun went off, and Harrison was off to an early lead. But he stumbled on a hurdle, and the thousands watching realized as soon as he did that by a quirk of fate, he had missed his chance to go to the Olympics in the event he had trained for for years. He was one of the best hurdlers in the world, and he hadn't even qualified. Seconds after that defeat, he quickly made a decision. He entered the 100-meter dash and made the Olympic team by a quarter of an inch. At the Olympics, no one even considered him a possibility to win the event. He was a hurdling champion, not a 100-meter dash champion. But 100,000 people watched that day as Harrison Dillard did claim the dream of his life, did win 
his Olympic gold medal. He had tried another way. Does the name Jerry Dorsey mean anything to you? He wanted to be a singer. He tried and sang and tried some more. All he could get were jobs in small clubs, and he was lucky to have those. Every record label in the business had dropped him. Twelve years of disappointments, and one year in the hospital with tuberculosis. He decided to get a new manager. One day he was rehearsing with the boys in the band, and the phone rang. They heard him say, just a minute, let me write those letters down. E-N-G-E-L-B-E-R-T-H-U-M-P-E-R-D-I-N-C-K. He put the phone down. He said he wants me to change my name from Jerry Dorsey to Engelbert Humberdink. They laughed. They thought that was the funniest thing. His manager said, Jerry, your name is so associated with failure, I can't get you a job. I want you to have a name so far removed from Jerry Dorsey. And it was. They'll never associate the two. This is fact. Decca Records had just dropped Jerry Dorsey. The same year, they hired Engelbert Humperdinck. His first record sold 5,000, his second 10,000, and his third won a gold disc. Within three and a half years, he was a multimillionaire and one of the best-known singers in England and America. <laughs> Sometimes you try again. Sometimes you try another way. The next time you think about Sylvester Stallone or a Laurie Schaefer or an Ernest Hemingway, think twice before saying, born to be. And remember, rehearse the fight scene 35 and a half hours for every one minute you saw on film. Enter the Miss Ohio pageant four years in a row. Rewrote one chapter 39 times. It's that little bit more. Perhaps it's trying just one more time, one more job interview, one more call to a customer, one more rewrite of the paragraph. Or perhaps it's trying a different way. If you've ever thought about yourself as a failure, remember, you're not alone. Failure and rejection and no's are a part of everyone's life. If you sometimes feel like dropping out of school or society or our world today... Just remember, you're taking the easy way out. Anyone can quit. A high school girl wrote, It takes guts to stay involved in life today, to find your way, to find your niche, to find where you fit in this world. It does take courage to stay in and fight it out, who you are, what you want to do, where you belong. I'm sure that sometime, somewhere, there was something you wanted to accomplish, something that was important to you. Whatever it was, if you didn't do it, and others did, think twice before saying, they're really lucky. Is it luck? Or did they try harder? What do you care about doing? How hard will you try? How long will you try? How many different ways will you try? You are the only one who can answer those questions. Hello, I'm Marilyn Vanderber. I recently read a book written by Barbara Walters of ABC entitled How to Talk with Practically Anybody About Practically Anything. She's written about many of the famous people she's interviewed. She told about a woman whose husband was running for the President of the United States. She was suddenly thrown into the limelight being interviewed on radio and television, speaking before large groups of people. 
When Barbara Walters asked her how she coped with this sudden fame and attention, the woman replied that at first she was nervous, but she cured herself one day by deciding, I am the way I am. There are many people who find this idea comforting. Haven't you heard people say something similar? That's just the way I am, or I was born that way. I can't help it. In conducting adult seminars and working with students, I heard this idea so many times in so many different ways. I decided to devote one entire student presentation just to this idea. And I said, I hope at the end of 30 minutes, you're going to begin adding some words to that sentence. I am the way I am today but I can change. After the presentation, I asked them to write down the answer to this question. If you could change one thing about yourself, what one thing would you like to change? And I was so surprised to find a high percentage of junior and senior high school students feeling they were overweight and that it affected how they thought about themselves, their friendships, their schoolwork, their lives. There are an estimated 79 million overweight people in America, 79 million. And it finally dawned on me, it's how we think about ourselves, that's what counts. If we're healthy and happy with who we are, then why should we change? But if we're not, then we should change. Jean Nidish had said it for 38 years, I am the way I am. She was 5'7", weighed 214 pounds, and wore a size 44 dress. She said, I used to ask myself, why am I fat? I don't eat that much. I never ate breakfast. I got nauseated just thinking about breakfast. Actually, she was a compulsive eater. She said, I'd get up at 3 a.m. and have a lamb chop sandwich between two slices of salami. I used to hide chocolate cake in the laundry hamper. She said, when I was in school, no one ever called me fat. They called me chubby. And by the time I was 15, I hated the word chubby. She said, I was always on a diet. I'd go on fat diets for a whole week. I would eat just one kind of food or nothing at all. I'd lose a little, and then I would reward myself for my sacrifices. She said, for the major portion of my life, I alternately starved my body or overindulged it. I saved diets. I pasted them in albums. I saved them in shoeboxes. I even labeled them. Likes don't like. Works doesn't work. She said, I even had an album of diets I wrote myself. Although I lost weight dozens of times, it always came back. And with the added pounds came the depression, knowing that once again, I was a failure. She said, some people need to be hurt badly before they do anything about themselves. Some people have told me that what finally changed them was the first time they stood up in a restaurant and the chair came up with them. She said, this is the way it happened to me. I was pushing my shopping cart in the supermarket when a girl I hardly knew came up to me and she said, Jean, you look absolutely marvelous. When's the baby due? She said, that hurt. That really hurt. She had said it for 38 years, but that day caused her to add some words to that sentence. I am the way I am today, but I can change. She went to a health obesity clinic. She was given a diet. She said, I had seen hundreds of diets before, but I felt this was my last chance, so I stuck with it. She lost 72 pounds in one year on a sensible, well-balanced diet and went in time from a size 44 to a size 12. She is, as you probably know, Jean Neidich, the founder of Weight Watchers. For 56 years, Patrick O'Kelly had been a sailor, sailing on any ship that would hire him. It was the only job he had ever known. After losing a lung in a cancer operation, knowing he would never be a sailor again, he remembers lying in his hospital bed thinking, what am I going to do now? How many people at age 15 or 40 or 65 say to themselves, what am I going to do now? When they lose the only job they've ever known or when they don't even know how to go about finding a job. But O'Kelly had another problem. He had never learned to read or write. He didn't understand as much about the alphabet as a first grader. When a hospital volunteer asked him if he would like to take some correspondence courses to prepare himself for a new career, he was too ashamed to tell her that he couldn't read or write. He'd never told anyone that. 
When he finally told her, she asked if he would like to learn to read. It was humiliating to him as he sat in his bed trying to read, see the dog, see the dog run. Everyone in the hospital ward laughed at him as he tried to change something in his life that had always been so painful for him. Instead of lashing back at those who laughed at him or quitting because he was embarrassed, he laughed at himself right along with them. And soon it was like a game. It became fun as everyone tried to help him learn. Hour after hour, day after day, they would drill him on his lessons. His goal was to be able to read well enough to read the want ads. He continued learning, but was too sick to work. Because he needed money, he decided to write poetry about the sea. He finally got the courage to submit six of his poems, and three were accepted. Then he began writing children's books. At age 56, Patrick O'Kelly decided to change something that he had always been ashamed of. And when others laughed at him, he found that if you can learn to laugh at yourself, people will stop laughing at you and will laugh with you. Rex Reed has written about the movie star and Academy Award winner, Ellen Burstyn. He quotes her as saying, I was born poor, uneducated, and everybody laughed at everything I ever wanted to do with my life. Now I know I could have been a scientist, but nobody ever told me a girl could be a scientist. When I was 18, I set out to educate myself. I started by reading the encyclopedia and taking notes. I know everything there is to know about bridges and the history of architecture in England. I memorized all the state capitals and the names of the English kings. Then I saw somebody doing the New York Times crossword puzzle, and that became my college education. One puzzle would take an entire week because it had to be completely researched. I'd look up all the words in the dictionary, then use the encyclopedia, the World Atlas, every reference book I could find. I did that for five years while I worked as a short order cook, a sign painter, a fashion coordinator. It took me a year before I could even do half a puzzle. After five years, I could finally do them without reference books, and that is how I changed, how I educated myself. How I learned to think. When I was a sophomore in college, I was nominated by my sorority sisters for Miss University of Colorado when I was out of the room. I was so shy, I told them I couldn't possibly do it. But they said I couldn't decline because the meeting was over and every unit on campus had to have the nomination in by 9 o'clock the next morning or they would be fined. The night of the pageant, I told the boy I was dating that if he walked into the auditorium, I would walk off the stage. And then when I won, it was only six weeks before the Miss Colorado pageant, I knew I would have to do something to overcome my almost paralyzing fear of standing up before an audience to speak. So I enrolled in a summer school course in public speaking. The first day we were to do a short reading or poem before the class. As my boyfriend was driving me to class, I recited what I was going to do, and he laughed. He didn't mean to hurt my feelings or upset me but he had no understanding of how shy I was or how difficult it was going to be for me. I guess I didn't appear to be as shy as I was. I never went to class that day. I never took the course. I faced the audience at the Miss Colorado pageant and five weeks later, the Miss America pageant, so shy and so scared, I couldn't sleep at night. It's taken me years to conquer my fear of speaking. Change has been a long and painful process, but it sure has been worth it. Ken Venturi wanted to change. He stammered so badly by age 12 that he couldn't even speak a full sentence. It was so embarrassing to him that he refused to speak in school or to talk on the telephone. Children laughed at him. He's left-handed, and as a boy, people kept trying to change him from being left-handed to being right-handed. It's now believed that this is what started his stammering. He wanted to change. What was so embarrassing to him? He felt he had to do it alone, and so every day after school, he would go to the public golf course and hit balls. Every day for four years, he would play by himself. He pretended people were watching him play tournaments, and he would win, and explain to those imaginary people which club he would use and why, and how to hit the different shots. He would even give the acceptance speeches for the tournaments. 
after four years of playing alone, every single day, he had cured his stuttering. And his career as a professional golfer had begun. He went on to win the most prestigious golf tournament of all, the U.S. Open. He conquered his stuttering problem so completely, he is now a television sports commentator for CBS. In 1962, Ron Lyle was convicted of second-degree murder and was sentenced to 15 to 25 years in prison. That was in 1962. In 1972, the Denver Chamber of Commerce named him the Outstanding Young Man of the Year. Somewhere between 1962 and 1972, Ron Lyle changed. At age 17, he was convicted of second-degree murder and spent seven and a half years in prison before he was paroled. Let me tell you some of the feelings he's had. Let me quote his words. I was born into a family of 19 children. Think it's fun being black and coming from a family of 19? Well, take my word for it. It's no picnic. I used to steal things to make money. At first it was bicycles, then purses. I got caught and had to spend time in a reformatory. When I went to prison at age 17, I was bitter and at times a troublemaker. I got into a fight with another prisoner. He stabbed me in the stomach with a homemade knife. The tip punctured an artery near my spine, and the doctors could not stop the bleeding. I was declared dead twice on the operating table. They used 35 pints of blood during the seven-hour operation. After I got out of the hospital, I was put into isolation for 90 days. I had a lot of time to think. I decided I wanted something out of life better than I'd had. I decided to make sports my life and to be a success. I decided to change. As a starter in solitary confinement, I began working out. At the end of 90 days, I could do 1,000 push-ups and 500 sit-ups. I knew I wanted a boxing career and that I wanted to try to help kids get started in the right direction. Ron Lyle became one of the top-ranked heavyweight boxers in the world, and he also became involved in helping children. He was the chairman of the Colorado March of Dimes Walkathon. He personally led thousands of teenagers and volunteers on a 20-mile march. It was the most successful walkathon in their history. He was the chairman of the Denver Association for Retarded Children. The Denver Chamber of Commerce named him the Outstanding Young Man of the Year. From bitterness and hostility and crime to involvement and commitment, Ron Lyle changed. What would you like to change in your life? Are you unhappy with what you're doing? Or are you just wandering, wishing you could find something important to devote your life to? This was Mary Calderon's story. She wanted to be an artist, then a poet, then a pianist. For years, she kept throwing herself into new pursuits. She said, I just couldn't find what I wanted to do. But she kept looking. She didn't settle for that life of quiet desperation. She wasn't going to live a life of clock watching or complaining. At age 31, she began to wonder if going into medicine wasn't what she really wanted to do. She began to feel so strongly about it, she said, for almost the first time in my life, I was being someone I liked. She was 10 years older than anyone else at the University of Rochester, and it certainly wasn't easy. But she had found her life's work, not just a job, a career so exciting she couldn't wait to get up in the morning. How did it turn out for her, beginning med school at age 31, so difficult an age to begin anew? The world-famous Dr. Carl Menninger recently said, she is one of the great figures of our era, now 75, still involved and totally committed. An article in a major magazine recently stated, Dr. Calderon's work has profoundly changed the quality of life in this century. Her life changed because she changed it, and she kept changing it until at age 31 she could say, for almost the first time in my life, I was being someone I liked. She had found purpose. Is the name Rod Laver familiar to you? 
When he began playing professional tennis, he lost 21 out of his first 23 matches. He said, I was 25 and I was a tennis player and I thought if I wasn't going to be a winner, what was the point of it all? He was a loser, but he changed. He concentrated. He began to work on his weaknesses in tennis. He began to change them into his strong points. When he was a boy, his father thought his older brother would be the better tennis player. The tennis coach said, Trevor has beautiful strokes better than Rod's. But Trevor has an explosive temper. Rod is quiet and determined. Rod will make it. His brother did not overcome his temper. He did not change. And it was Rod who became one of the great tennis players in the world. Historic Wimbledon, Britain's shrine to tennis, is the scene once more of the finals in the men's singles championship. The two principals take the court. Rod Lever, Australia, left. And Chuck McKinley, first American in the finals in six years. Lever, on the other hand, has lost out twice after reaching the finals. Match point, and one of the greatest volleys ever staged on Wimbledon's hallowed court. goes down fighting as Labor, changing pace at will, finally puts over match point. It's a sweet victory for the 22-year-old redhead. This time, the Wimbledon crown did not slip from his grasp. The reward for his straight-set victory is the trophy presented by the Duchess of Kent. The Duchess honors a king. One of the great college football coaches of all time was fired because he didn't change. Woody Hayes had always had an explosive temper. And it didn't seem as if he ever tried to change it, and it finally cost him his job. It ended his career in disgrace, as literally millions of people watched the coach of Ohio State University, angry and frustrated because he was losing, swing at a player on the other team during a game. Not even his record of 238 wins, 72 ties, and only 10 losses saved him. He had lost his temper one time too many, and it cost him not just his job, but the career he loved, the coaching he lived for. The New York Mets baseball team was formed in 1962. In their first seven seasons, they finished last five times and next to last twice. They lost 737 games. Time magazine called them the most ludicrous team in the history of baseball. One of the rookie players said he found the business of losing day after day downright humiliating. He said the crowd would give you a standing ovation if you only caught the ball. It was an achievement just to play and not get hurt. Fans would come to the games with banners reading, We don't want to set the world on fire. We just want to finish ninth. There were only ten teams. But in the eighth year, it changed. The Mets began to win and win and win. They won, in fact, the World Series, and the longtime laughingstocks became the champions of the world. New York went wild. Schools and offices closed. Celebrations were everywhere. New Yorkers threw paper out of the window in a sort of ticker tape celebration. Any paper they could find, computer cards, turn up phone books. So much paper landed on the streets. Cars skidded. Horns were honking. People were cheering. Within one year, the Mets had changed. There were reasons for the change, of course. But the point to remember is that for seven years, they were losers, laughed at, and within one season, they were the world champions. Some of you may be on top of the world. You may have worked very hard for your accomplishments, or you may have found that you've been quite lucky. No matter how it has happened, it's important to remember that Nothing stays the same. There will be change. Just like a plant. We either grow or we die. Nothing stays the same. You will either continue to excel and become more accomplished, or you will decline. Let's look at the television networks. For 21 years, CBS had been number one. And for years, NBC was number two. And ABC? Well, ABC was laughed at. For years, many people joked that there were two and a half networks. But it changed. And ABC went from being the lowest in 1975 to being number one in 1976. And by 1978, ABC had gone right off the charts with the number one position. There are always reasons for change. 
Sometimes people or companies in the top positions don't keep growing. William Paley said CBS's problems started years ago when we ran out of new shows, attractive new shows, to replace the older shows that were starting to lose audiences. Maybe we were too satisfied and content. It was careless, and it should not have happened. By 1980, it had changed again, and CBS had pulled ahead of ABC. You can be the winner today and the loser tomorrow. You can also be the loser today and the winner tomorrow. Perhaps the greatest example of this in American history is Richard Nixon. An interesting story. He started his career as an attorney and was elected U.S. Senator at age 33. He was re-elected at age 39. Eisenhower selected him as his vice presidential running mate. They won. They were re-elected in 1956, but it can change. In 1960, with four successful elections behind him, he ran for president against John F. Kennedy and lost by one half of one percent. It was the closest vote in American history. Two years later, he decided to run for the governor of California. The Saturday Evening Post said, if Pat Brown wins, Nixon is finished. If Nixon can't win California, his home state, he would be a flimsy political candidate for 1964. He didn't win, and this time he was defeated by more than 300,000 votes. Time magazine wrote, barring a miracle, Nixon is finished. For eight years, he was labeled a loser. He had lost the presidency and the California governorship. Six years later, at age 55, he decided to run again. To win just the Republican nomination, he had to run against Governor Romney of Michigan, Governor Rockefeller of New York, and Governor Reagan of California. What chance would you have given him? How? And why did he win? During those six years, he had traveled hundreds of thousands of miles from Maine to Hawaii. During the 1966 election campaign alone, he campaigned for 105 local and state candidates. Nixon won the nomination and ran against Humphrey for the presidency. Nixon won by only four-tenths of one percent. In 1972, he ran again against McGovern and won by the greatest popular vote in history. And in 1974, Nixon became the only president in American history to be forced to resign in total disgrace. You can be the loser today and the winner tomorrow. You can be the winner today and the loser tomorrow. You will change. Nothing stays the same. Everyone changes. And I suppose everyone would like to change in some way. I was fascinated to learn how Benjamin Franklin changed. If the six greatest Americans in history were to be listed, he would certainly be among them. No other American except perhaps Thomas Jefferson has ever done so many things so well. In reading his autobiography, I was intrigued to learn that he thought about himself as a man of ordinary ability. He'd only had two years of schooling. But he believed he could become a man of exceptional success if he could just find the way to do it. He wanted to improve himself, and he wanted to overcome some bad habits. He did change, and this is how he did it. He listed 13 characteristics that he wanted to acquire or master. Every week, he would concentrate on trying to do one of them. The third week, for example, he worked on being more orderly, organizing his thoughts, having everything in its place. The eleventh week, he worked on tranquility, trying not to be angry or upset by unimportant things or by things he couldn't avoid or control. Each day, he would put a little black dot on his chart if he didn't follow through. After thirteen weeks, devoting one week to trying to perfect each one, he would start over and do the list again. 
He said by daily practice, it wasn't long before these were a permanent part of my character. When he was 79 years old, he said he felt this one thing accounted for all his success and happiness. In his autobiography, he devoted 15 pages just to this idea. He wrote more about this than anything that ever happened to him in his entire life. This man who signed the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, who founded the University of Pennsylvania and served as Minister to France, think of the incredible experiences of his life, and yet he attributed his success and happiness to this one idea. If Benjamin Franklin, one of the most outstanding men in history, believed this was the most important thing he ever did, isn't it worth considering? He didn't just say, I am the way I am. He did change because he wanted to, planned how he would do it, and then disciplined himself to follow his plan. Isn't it worth trying? Why not write down just one thing you would like to change about yourself? One thing you would devote a week to thinking about, concentrating on? Would it be how you spend your time, your weight, your temper, self-discipline, being cheerful instead of complaining all the time? You can change from unemployed to a rewarding new job, from drugs to freedom from addiction, from shy to confident, from average to outstanding. And now is the time. Make this your moment of decision. Face whatever you have to face and get it over with. The longer you delay, the harder it will be. I am the way I am today, but I can change. And I will begin right now. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Think about it. You can begin all over. You can begin the rest of your life today. No matter what you've done or how you've lived, you can change. The question is, will you? I'm Marilyn Vanderber. The theme of the last seminar was, you can change. After sharing these ideas one day with students, I asked them, if you could change one thing about yourself, what one thing would you like to change? An eighth grade boy wrote, I'm going to change my height. And a 12th grade girl wrote, I'm going to get my divorced parents back together. And I began to realize the importance of today's theme. It's based on this quote, God grant me the courage to change the things I can, accept the things I cannot change, and the wisdom to know the difference. Do you remember Jimmy Durante? He was one of America's best-loved entertainers. He once said all of us have schnozzles. He was referring, of course, to his big nose. But what he was saying was that everyone has something different about them. A big nose, a scar, crooked teeth, a birthmark too tall, too short, and many people have other things they cannot change. A disrupted family life, an illness or disease, the death of a loved one. During the last seminar, I hope I convinced you that you can change certain things. It's equally important to realize that those things which cannot be changed must be accepted. This could be the greatest challenge of all. Sammy Davis, Jr. has always been one of my favorite entertainers. He began performing at age three. He didn't begin to be recognized as a great entertainer until age 26. Let me quote from his autobiography, Yes, I Can. I sat in the dressing room rereading my reviews in the New York Daily News. The best, fastest, and most furious young entertainer to come along in some time is a 26-year-old named Sammy Davis, Jr. As the old saying goes, God made Sammy as ugly looking as he could, and then he hit him in the face with a shovel. He said, I stared at my face in the mirror. 
I guess I'd gotten used to it. Not too long after that, he was in a tragic automobile accident. They had to remove one of his eyes. Days later, when they took the bandages off, he said, I stared at my nose. It was flatter than ever, and there was a big gash across the bridge. Oh, wait a minute, Doc. I was never exactly a debutante, but this is ridiculous. When he took the bandage off my left eye, I expected to see a hole. But the lid had been sewn closed like a Boris Karloff makeup job. The doctor said we took 30 stitches inside and outside the lid. He said I could see how the lid had been busted like a paper bag and all the ragged ends that must have been hanging loose had been sewn back together to make one piece. In the midst of this grotesque piece of flesh, I had long eyelashes. The doctor had slid open the edge of the lid and stuck the hairs in one by one like putting toothpicks into an orange so that I'd have something there until the new eyelashes started growing. Sammy Davis, Jr., he was short. He knew he was ugly. All he wanted to do was to be up on stage singing and entertaining, and now he only had one eye. He accepted what he could not change. He forced himself back on stage, first with a patch covering one eye, then with a glass eye. He is one of the superstars of all time. Probably the most amazing story of all is Charlie Boswell, all-American halfback from the University of Alabama and a basketball star as well. He had a chance to play professional football and baseball, but when World War II came, he was sent to fight in Europe. A shell hit his tank, and he was totally blinded. All he had wanted to do was to become an athlete. His life had been sports. How could he accept being blind? He did accept it and began playing golf. Charlie Boswell won the world championship for blind golfers. He shot a 38 for nine holes on a championship course. Now that's almost par. I watched them play at the blind golfers tournament. Someone plays with the blind golfer and tells him about the course. He'll say the course is straight ahead for about 200 yards, then it veers to the right for about 100 yards. There are some trees to the right, a little lake to the left. Then when they get on the green, many ask for a rattle to be put in the cup, and the golfer putts to the sound. Totally blind, and Charlie Boswell shot almost par on a championship course. Peter Falk, handsome television and movie star. At the age of three, he lost his right eye as the result of a tumor. They put in a glass eye. Did he walk through his school days with his hand over his eye because he was so embarrassed? He became the president of his senior class. He was an outstanding baseball player. One day he slid into third base. The umpire made a bad call and called him out. He took out his glass eye. He said, here, you could use another eye. He had accepted what he couldn't change so completely. He could even laugh at himself. When he wanted to enlist in the Marines, he memorized the eye chart in advance. He almost passed the eye test before his glass eye was noticed. He said one eye didn't move and they thought something was fishy. He began acting in a small community theater. Then Broadway, television films. He must have been excited when Columbia Pictures sent for him to come to Hollywood for a screen test. They did not sign him. A top executive of, of Columbia said, for the same price, I can get an actor with two eyes. Wouldn't that statement be enough to make you quit? Give up? Peter Falk must have accepted what he could not change. No one remembers which two-eyed actor Columbia Pictures hired, but within two years, Peter Falk had won two Oscar nominations. 
Bruce Furness has swum competitively since he was five years old, enjoying good health 